And you can be seated, of course. I want to start off with some thank yous. Uh, I want to thank all those who honored my request that you pray for me. I was overwhelmed this morning with a number of folks here who said they were praying for me. And then I got a text from my son in Hawaii who said he was praying for me. And I got a text from Stephen Carpenter in Colorado who said he was praying for me. And I got a text from my daughter in Baltimore City who said she was praying for me. So I guess I need it. <laughs> Hopefully all that prayer reflects well on your experience here this morning. Um, recently, as you know, and I want to mention another thanks. We've been doing a lot of deep dives in Scripture. And I do want to thank Tom Shetlick once again for all the work that he does in organizing the sermons through the year. And if you've been here, you know that we've done six sermons so far on Christ in the Old Testament. And there will be more coming, uh, of which one I will be doing myself later in the year. Uh, we've also done five sermons on Israel at Sinai. And if you haven't heard already, we have a three-week series coming up starting next week on Habakkuk. So if you haven't heard that name before, come and you'll find out about Habakkuk uh, here at Forge Row Bible Chapel. This Sunday happens to be a pick-your-own Sunday, so I got to pick my own topic. And those of you who are, know me well enough know that I have been wrestling for a few months now with what I should share today. And uh, again, I appreciate the prayers of those who've, who've offered those prayers on my behalf for help, and I trust that the Lord will use what I have for you this morning. Having said all that, let's thank the Lord. Lord God, you are good and holy and righteous and just and perfect. And Lord, somehow, as all of those things, you're also knowable. Oh, that is amazing. Thank you for your word, which instructs us concerning who you are and your desire for a relationship with us. Lord, bless this time together as we look into your word and as we think about its implications for us. Lord, uh, may it be profitable. May your Holy Spirit move. And may these folks be challenged and encouraged uh, in what they're doing, and maybe what they could do more. And we just pray these things now, Lord, looking for your blessing upon this time. In Jesus' name, amen. So... <clears throat> Discovery Channel has a series out called Gold Rush. I won't ask you to raise your hands to see how many people have, are familiar with that series, but I, I have watched a few seasons myself, and uh, it's an interesting show about people who are hunting for treasure, particularly for gold. And, and this picture actually is from a later season, uh, and these three gentlemen are actually fairly successful at this business. But in the show, there's a lot of failures as well, people who've tried and failed. And uh, I like to think of myself as kind of in this category, but realizing I'm actually more like in this category. <laughs> <coughs> One of the things I, I hope to do this morning is share with you a little bit of the mind of Bill. Now, that may sound scary, maybe for good reason. Um, but what have I learned? What am I experiencing in my own walk with the Lord? And maybe this will challenge some of you who are on this end of the spectrum and somewhere in between in your own walk with the Lord and your own experience, your daily experience in your walk with Him. And it is possible that you can be successful in all of those ranges. This young man has been extremely successful in the show. In fact, uh, I was watching online trying to catch up on some of the show and he just bought this huge property for $8 million cash uh, with the gold that he's, he's uh, won from his efforts. But in that show, they show a lot of highs and lows, but in the end, to keep you hooked, the climax of every episode and of every season is the gold totals. They weigh them out. Let's weigh the gold and see how much we actually have. Now, some of you may think of gold and, and finding gold is finding these nuggets, right? That's gold hunting. And that's not really true. Gold nuggets are very rare. In fact, for these guys on the show, these are considered large nuggets. They're excited when they find nuggets like these in their wash plants. And uh, they're, they're, they're relatively rare. And in fact, the huge money comes from the fine gold that they get out of their machines. Um, and they... The work that they have to do to get this fine gold is astounding. There's a huge amount of work to get this fine gold out of the ground. But when it's done correctly, it turns out it's worth it. 
all the money they spend on the huge machinery, the fuel, living in Alaska. Most of, most of the show is in, focused in Alaska, although they do go to other parts of the world. But it's a fine gold that you want to uh, get if you're one of these miners. Again, more miners fail than exceed, but if you understand the rules of the game and the procedures for doing it correctly, you can win. And I'm using this this morning as an analogy to our own spiritual experience, our own spiritual walk. We know from Scripture, particularly the Psalms, Psalm 119, 162 says, I rejoice at your word as one who finds great treasure. Do you do that, Christian? We should rejoice at God's word because in it is contained great treasure. And there's also, you may have thought of this verse uh, if you're more seasoned like I am, Psalm 19.10, More desired are they than gold, that is God's word, even much fine gold. I thought that was interesting, that even in biblical times, they knew that the fine gold is really what you want to find. Because there's a lot of fine gold, less chunks. And God's word has a lot of fine gold in it, but it takes work to find. Now, there have been some unusually large finds in the past. In fact, the largest known nugget ever found was found on February 5th, 1869 in Australia. The chunk itself was named the Welcome Stranger, I guess so. It weighed 214 pounds, and at today's value, it was worth it is worth 600 uh, sorry, $6,420,000 for digging up one rock. Now it turns out that this rock was under a tree only an inch or two below the surface. It was very easy to find. Well, it turns out, I think, that Scripture is like that. There are some huge chunks that are hard to miss. In fact, Christians have condensed these down into things we call creeds. Things that we as Christians say are true, and we love to stand around and look at these large nuggets because they're amazing. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15 is an example of such a creed. It's one of the earliest creeds, and it's actually in the Bible. 1 Corinthians 15, 3-5 says, this is Paul writing, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins. That's important, isn't it? <laughs> that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day. If you paid attention last weekend, you know that's important, right? And that he appeared to Cephas and then to the Twelve. And this is considered one of the early creeds. I mean, that's, that's a big nugget that's hard to miss, isn't it? Christ died for my sins, he was buried, and he rose again on the third day. And the resurrection, if, if, you don't face any, if you're not a believer here today, you should confront the resurrection. The historicity of it is, is very real. There's lots of evidence for more than almost any other historical event, and it's hard to deny if someone rose from the dead that something important wasn't going on there. And so this is one of our big nuggets. And there are other creeds, the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, the Athanasian Creed, and there are others as well um, that summarize these big gold nuggets, these non-negotiables, things that we say. When you look up on a church's website, what do we believe? Many of these things are going to be contained right there. They're the big, important things. But my own experience has also told me that there's lots of other fine gold in Scripture. And it's worth digging after. And I'll suggest that we live in an age where the new equipment that's available to us gives us really no excuse for not mining for it. Um, and I've been greatly encouraged in my own uh, Bible study. And it's way easier these days for a believer to strike it rich. A, 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 a lay believer. A lay believer can strike it rich just like a, an academic scholar in religious studies because we have these wonderful tools that are available to us. Now, I'm not saying it's worth, not worth going to, to Bible school and studying Scripture and, and those kinds of things in that way, but, and Steve, if you're listening, that's for you because uh, I know that's what you're doing. Um, but I can do that too. I have that privilege, too, of mining Scripture for those things that are in it that are amazing truth. And it always is amazing treasure. Now, the thing is that 
that new technology gives them the opportunity for, to maybe mine for things that were missed in the past. So in the Gold Rush episode, there's this in the show, there's this one episode where the old guy, Tony Beats is his name, really rough kind of guy, but he owned property that had been mined in the past, so, some of it, and there were tailings laying around on his property. Now, tailings are the things that come out of the machines that they use to mine gold. But it was done like in the 1800s. And they had pretty good equipment back then. But he knew he had better equipment, so he decided, I'm going to reprocess these tailings and just see if I can get more gold out. And sure enough, he went back using this new technology and reprocessed these tailings and got enough money to justify all that effort. I mean, it was already mined. He just had to dump it through the plant again, right? So he saved on the expense of having to get it out of the ground, and he just reprocessed it and got all this new stuff out. And again, that's kind of been my experience, that I have uh, used new technology and it's helped me get more stuff out of the ground for me. For me. Now, the other thing I'll say is that you still got to do the panning. Panning, you know, you see that in gold, old gold shows, they have the pan and they put some water and material in it and flip it around and get the water out and gold is left in the pan. They still do that. When they're looking for new ground, they pan the material to see if it's worth mining. Before they bring in all the big equipment, they take the pan out, get some material, put it in the pan, and they look for colors. Well, they count 10 little specks of gold. Oh, this is good. Like, I mean, it's like little sand. Oh, wow, that's a lot. You know, it's barely anything, but for them, that's a lot. And it tells them it's worth processing or not. They find nothing. They don't go ahead and process that land. The same thing's true for me as a believer. I've got to be spending time panning in the Word. I've got to spend time daily reading God's Word and looking for veins of gold that maybe I want to follow. Now, it doesn't happen every day, but the fact that in my lifetime, and again, this comes from the older guy now, I've spent, I've committed myself to reading God's Word daily. Don't do it every day, but I try to do it pretty much every day. And I've read through the Bible multiple times. And I've actually written something about every verse in the Bible in my own personal notes. Because for me, I've got a right to pay attention. I don't know about you, but that's helped, helped me pay attention. And I'm finding that now, I recall verses in my head. Somebody says something, oh yeah, there's a verse about that somewhere, and I remember the phrase of the verse. Now, the brilliant thing about the technology that I now have available, I really have kind of a bad general memory, like names and references in the Bible I'm not great with. But if I remember the phrase, there's this great biblical tool called Google. And if you type that phrase in, it takes you right to the verse. And so when I'm sitting in Breaking of Bread and I'm throwing verses out from Breaking of Bread, it's not because Bill has such a great reference memory. I remember the verses and then Google them and find them and then I can read them. So don't be too impressed. Um, <laughs> because I've, I've just learned to take advantage of the, the resources that are available. And I want to give you some examples of my own experience. Now, this message has the risk of lots of tangents for me, which is bad. So I've had to exercise great discipline to not go down a lot of these veins that I'm going to share with you. Um, you can ask my wife. I was struggling First and Second Corinthians with eight verses that I wanted to leave in really bad. And she's like, no, nope, you got to cut that out. <laughs> okay, cut. So that happened quite a lot. Here's some things that I've been learning, and I'm going to give you some assignments. I'm a retired teacher, so I have to do that, uh, that you can do on your own, based on what I share. So I've been doing my own devotionals in Ezekiel. It's been exciting. And I've just finished a Bible study in Revelation. So I was doing Ezekiel and Revelation simultaneously. Uh, Scott Narowski and myself went through Revelation together, and uh, that was a challenging study. But I was doing my mining and came across a couple nuggets that I wanted to share with you. This is kind of what happens to me. So if this doesn't happen to you, maybe it's something you can work towards. So I was reading the judgment of Tyre in Ezekiel. And I read this verse. They shall destroy the walls of Tyre and break down her towers, and I will scrape her soil from her and make her a bare rock. Now, the thing that jumped out at me, now Tom Shetley likes to say it, reached out and grabbed me by the collar, right? Well, more and more I've been getting, that's, that's the gold nuggets I'm finding, right? This gold, whoa, look, a gold nugget. 
And in this verse, the gold nugget was this. I will scrape her soil from her. When, when Tyre fell, God made sure that the city was scraped clean of even its topsoil. That's what it says. And the, the, the place where Tyre used to stand became a place to dry fishing nets because it was just bare rock. Tyre was a center of commerce. Wow. When God seriously judges, he judges seriously. <laughs> and then I read this in Revelation 20, verse 9. And they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. This is the enemy. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. This is the end times. The armies of the world gather together and come up against God's people. And fire came down from heaven and consumed them. The end. You know the movies where the aliens come and humanity comes together to fight the aliens? Classic theme, right? <clears throat> well, there's not going to be much of a fight when the heavenly alien, although he is a resident of earth as well, but when God shows up and comes down to this place and stands with his people and the, the humanity comes against them and they're done. I mean, done, boom, it's just, what, how many words is that? Eight words and the war's over. You ever hear of a war ending that quickly? Crazy. And so those are the kinds of things that I see as uh, gold nuggets in Scripture, right? This idea of God's judgment. So here's your first assignment on your own, because I could do a whole message on this, but I'm not going to. Study passages of Scripture when holy heavenly beings, God and or angels, interact with a person or people. Next. February 25th, 2024, breaking of bread. Ben Dunkerton stands up and shares from Psalm 96. He talks about the fact that God is worthy of worship. So my brain starts churning. Well, verses about worship of God, and my brain goes to the angels. Uh, glory to God in the highest, right? That's where my brain goes. So I, I could take the time to try and skim. I know it's in the Gospels, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, one of those four. It's in there somewhere. But I just Googled it, and there it was in Luke 2. And uh, so I looked it up. And I found something that I didn't expect there, partly because of it was in the vein of Ezekiel and Revelation. So in Luke chapter 2, God arrives. Jesus is born. God arrives. And then angels come. Now when God arrives... It's not usually a good thing. And when, you know, think like Sodom and Gomorrah, right? And when angels come, it's usually not a good thing either. Think the trumpets and bowls in Revelation, right? Well, here in Luke 2, God arrives and angels arrive together. Now, this is going through my head and breaking a bread, right? And I'm like, wow, this is not a good thing for humanity. And if you were there, you may remember I stood up and asked the question, what was the first thing said by a heavenly being once God arrived? Fear not. To the, to the shepherds out in the fields, the angel said, fear not. Now this is after Jesus is born. The angel talked to Mary and talked to Joseph, right? That all had happened. But once Jesus is born, the first th once God arrives to a lost desperate, sinful planet, and then angels come in all their glory, what should we expect? <laughs> you read about Tyre's judgment, you read about Revelation judgment. Now, of course, they, the shepherds didn't have Revelation yet, but I'm reading it, right? And they had the whole Old Testament where lots of judgment is happening. Think about the angel that showed up to Egypt, the, the death angel. Just an angel. And all the firstborn die. Without the blood, you know, hopefully you know that story. Fear not. And, you know, I was like, wow, this is a nugget. This is a nugget that I want to I think about. Now, of course, I don't have time today, but why fear not? For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. That's the why of verse 10 here. Jesus did not come as judge, 
He came as Savior. He came as our friend from breaking your bread this morning. He came to redeem the lost. So I've got a real temptation right now to follow this vein. And I'm fighting it desperately, but I do have to share one thing. <laughs> you know, the Bible says, so fear God. So is it contradicting itself? You know, I had to think about this a little bit. Fear not, fear God, which one is it? And last week, somebody read some verses relating to the resurrection. And this is just another, you're, you're seeing the mind of Bill Dunkerton, right? This is a little nugget that flashed to me. Matthew 28, verses 2 to 5. And behold, there was a great earthquake. This is when Jesus rose from the dead. And an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angels said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. You're unsaved, be terrified. There's two fears going on here. The unsaved, the soldiers, see the angel and fall down as dead. They're terrified. If you're an unbeliever today, one of the best things I can exhort you to do is be afraid. The Bible says the fool doesn't fear the Lord. We need to fear the Lord. Now the believer, the women, the believers, the followers of Jesus... They were told to fear not. Now, not be terrified. We as believers still are his children, and we should have reverential fear for our father, right? Isn't it a good thing for a child to fear, in some ways, their father, right? If my father tells me, do not run out into that busy street, and if you do, I'm going to have to punish you, it's fear of his punishment that keeps me from kill it, getting killed. That's a good thing, right? And so there is appropriate good fear, for the believer. Simon 2, study passages dealing with the fear of God on your own. Another thing in this verse. This verse is packed. I bring you good news. It's not I bring you news. Look at that word good. I bring you good news. That's awesome. Number three, study passages, the phrase good news. I told you I had to cut stuff out. Great joy. Not just joy. Great joy. Does that hit you? Like, wow, that's kind of cool. I want to look at that nugget. Okay? Study passages that deal with great joy. <laughs> On your own. Flying here. But the next one hit me. Uh, well, let me share it first. All. That will be for all the people. Now, this one hit me a couple years ago, and I actually had uh, some notes on my, on my desk that have been sitting there for years about this word. And so because it came up in Breaking Your Bread, thank you, Ben, uh, several weeks ago, I decided now's the time to put it in there. So this is a big word, all, right? Um, now, I will give you the assignment. Study the passages for words that have all in it. But it turns out this is a huge vein, so I'm going to spend a few more minutes on this and maybe give you some helps for doing this work. Help you get your gold mining equipment going. Okay? And I'm going to show you some of the new stuff. Now, I'm sure many of you already are aware of this. This morning I woke up and was like, should I even show them this stuff? I don't want to offend anybody. Uh, you know, I'm, I am the old guy using technology. Um, but I'm going to do it anyway. So bear with me because the results are kind of cool. So what did I do? Uh, what do I do when I want to study the Bible? So first thing, you've got to know there's tools out there. What I would suggest is go home and get on Google and type in something like free online tools, free online Bibles. Now when I typed it in, I got, so these are some of the results. I don't know if you can see it there. and I don't have my glasses on, but I think that's 7 million, 779 million or something like that. 779 million results for free online Bible, okay? Um, so just Google that. And, and these are good resources. And most of these I think I've, I've looked at before. Um, 
The one that I've landed on is called Blue Letter Bible. Now, this is not an ad for Blue Letter Bible. They're free anyway, so, uh, but I've used it enough now that I've finally donated to them. I, I, I appreciate the resource. So that's what I tend to use more often than not. Blue Letter Bible is what it's called. So how do I use this resource? So I've got a little video clip here I'm going to show you, and hopefully this will work. Um, so I get back on Google. If you're going to do this at home, and you get on Google and you type in Blue Letter Bible, and of course it finds it because Google finds everything, and you open it up, and you click on Blue Letter Bible, and you get a page that looks like this. Now, it looks kind of empty, but there's a lot of stuff here. And what I just did there was I clicked over on the KJV, which is the version of the Bible. You know, one of the things we have great as Americans, we have access to all these resources, and we have lots of translations of Scripture. And these are all that they have available on this website. King James, New King James, New Living, New International, ESV, and it goes on. Some of these I don't know. Um, Greek and Hebrew is in here as well. Korean, I guess. There's a Spanish version. So you can access all of these. And so for this purpose, I went ahead and used the ESV. So I click on that, and then I go up to the search, and I type in John chapter 2, or sorry, Luke chapter 2, verse 10. And of course, it pops right up in the ESV when I search for it. And there it is, Luke chapter 2, verse 10. Right? And so I can read it. There it is. But you notice it also says tools. And if you click on tools, it gives you a menu. But if you just click on the verse itself, which I'll do here in just a moment, you get access to all these different tabs. Now, you'll notice the first thing it does almost instantly, or basically instantly, is it brings up the Greek version of that verse right there. In the, uh, this is the Greek version. And you may say it's Greek to you, and it is to me as well. I don't know Greek, but it's kind of cool what you can do with this stuff. Now, first, a couple other tabs. You can see this verse in all the other translations. That's always handy. I like reading other translations. I don't like to depend on just one. Um, so you can read all these different translations of just that verse. There are cross-references. So you can find other places where similar themes are used in Scripture. You can go to... Hurry up, Bill. Go to commentaries. There's hundreds of commentaries, both audio and written dictionaries there's a whole i didn't browse down miscellaneous pictures and songs that go along with the theme of that verse but i'm going to stick with interlinear now what i'm about to show you i i i used to know how to do you could do all this by hand and it took a long time and you had books and you could look up something called strong's numbers and uh, under the greek text and then take that to a concordance and find where that number is and it tells you all kinds of stuff remember i'm focusing on the word all here so you just browse down to the word all. Now you notice it is a phrase for all. So this word does get other things attached to it. And I'm not great with the grammar and all that, but in this case, it doesn't matter a whole lot. You can click on the little speaker over there and hopefully if the sound's turned up in the back. Strong's G 3956. Pass. Pass. So a really respectable man comes on and gives you the Greek. <laughs> you can hear the Greek version of that word. It, you can look up the Greek inflections that, that show all, it goes way down. Uh, that, oh, if you want to know how many times that word is used in the Bible, it used to be impressive when speakers told you that, now I can just look it up. There's <laughs> all is used 1,243 times in the New Testament. There's the definitions, right? Individually, each, every, all, collectively, some of all types, right? So that kind of makes sense for the word all. Um, and you get the Greek lexicon, which goes way down and when you open it up. And then, every place where it's used in the New Testament, they give you every verse. So all 1,000, what did it say? 1,200 and so and so many ver places that word is used. Scroll down, and that's just Matthew. Whoops, went a little too far. And then here's the rest of them. Through the whole New Testament, every place where that word is used. So I think that's kind of cool. Right? Every, I can find every place for that word. Now, as a guy who likes to talk and has trouble keeping his time down, this is bad, right? I mean, <laughs> this is where I had, there's a lot of good verses that use the word all in it. Um, so this is winding down here. And 
There, I haven't even scratched the surface of what's on this tool, right? Some people pay big money, by the way, for these tools and uh, for, for versions of these tools, and you can get it for free. So I'd encourage you to do that. Now, I want to look at some of the verses where this word is used. Now, again, you're in the mind of Bill. What do I do? So let's look at some of the verses where this is used. This is where I started to get impressed. You'll know some of these verses. It's used 1,243 times. Romans 3.23, anyone? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's where the word all is used. By the way, all is used eight times in Romans 3 and 61 times in Romans. All have sinned. John 3.16, anybody know that verse? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I think that's the King James Version because that's what I memorized as a kid. In John 3, all is used seven times and 60 times total in the book of John. And the word whoever is the word all. It's the same word. That all who believe. Philippians 2, 9 and 10. Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him uh, and bestowed on him the name that it, sorry, that is, that is ever, sorry, let me start that over. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, all names, so that at the name of Jesus, all knees should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. So you see how this works, right? The English translators tried to get it into something that would make more sense to us in English, but it's still the same word, all. Okay? Those are pretty important verses that contain the word all, aren't they? I mean, they're pretty high on the list of most important verses in Scripture. If you get a track, they usually have Romans 3.23 and John 3.16 in them, right? They're, they're, they're the heavy hitter verses for, for us as believers. Of course, every verse is a heavy hitter verse for us as believers, but, uh, but these are pretty important ones. How about Hebrews 4.15? For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who is in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Every is that word all. In all ways that we are tempted, he has been tempted. Colossians 2.9 In him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Pretty important verse. Now, I want to take the opportunity as I continue my mining expedition here. Um, to take a little tangent, these two verses are kind of interesting. Hebrews 4.15 says, God is fully human. He is in every way like you and me. If Jesus walked through that door, we'd say, oh, a visitor. There would be nothing about him that would make him any different than you or I. Colossians 2.9 says, God, Jesus is holy God. He is all God. Jesus is all man, and Jesus is all God. How can that be? How can something be 100% one thing and 100% something else? Now, this is something where you have to be careful with Scripture. Don't get so focused in on one verse and so caught up in one nugget that you forget all the other nuggets. The fact that Jesus Christ is fully human is a nugget, and I look at it and go, that is incredible. And the fact that Jesus Christ is fully God is its own nugget. I look at that and say, that is amazing. I like this nugget. And I like this nugget. And I'm not going to do this. This one's right. And the church has been through that. Right? There is a creed called the Chalcedonian Creed that's in font you can't read. That is one sentence. Yeah. And this creed was written because of this issue. And the, this part that's highlighted says this. Therefore, following the Holy Fathers, we all with one accord teach men, in accor uh, sorry, teach men to acknowledge one and the same Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at once complete in Godhead and complete in manhood, truly God and truly man. That's what Christians believe. Something that's hard to believe. But if, if neither one of those, if one of those things are not true, then the whole gospel's out the window. 
for this to work, both things have to be true. And so I stand back and say, wow, this is amazing. And I'm glad I can't understand everything there is to know about God. Because if I could understand everything there is to know about God, he wouldn't be God. And so I'm glad there's truths that are hard for me to get my head around and impress me with how awesome God is. So we have to be careful when we're out there mining that we don't get so caught up in our little thing that we forget the wealth of all the rest of Scripture. This has happened a lot. We're reading a book called The The Thrill of Orthodoxy. (laughs) And the title is terrible. (laughs) But the book is awesome. I'd encourage you to read it. And I want to read one Chapter 5, we just finished in men's breakfast last time. We did chapter 6 yesterday. But there's a section on the narrowness of heresy. And the author says this, A narrow-minded attachment to one truth can lead us away from the truth in all its beauty and complexity. Orthodoxy calls us to paradoxal truth. Heresies insist on either or, while orthodoxy freely embraces both end. Jesus is both man and and God. In orthodoxy, we see the coming together of seemingly contrary opposites, not in some sort of amalgamation or compromise, but simply affirming both in their fiery fullness. Our vision must be big enough to see truth from multiple angles, to see how truths connect and uphold each other. The orthodox keeps their wide eye, sorry, their eyes wide open to take in Christian truth in a way that honors its depth. Orthodoxy presents presents Christian truth in multiple dimensions. Heretics squint. So, fellow brothers and sisters of Forge Road Bible Chapel, keep your eyes wide open. I mean, the Bible's amazing. If you're studying something and you found something new, hunt around a little bit. Ask some brothers and sisters what they think. Make sure it's affirmed with the rest of Scripture. Study how to use the resources that are available. Do it. It's not that hard. That's your next assignment. Now, I'm not telling you to do all these things, but if you're interested in gold mining, pick one of these and try it. It's worth it. But it takes efforts outside of being here on Sunday. If you think that you're going to learn Scripture in one hour a week on Sunday mornings, you're fooling yourself. You need to be in the Word daily if you want to learn the Word, if you want to mind the Word, if you want to become impressed with God like you can become impressed with God when you're doing mining that that takes you to the depths of what Scripture has to offer. Being here on Sunday morning is not going to teach you really much at all about Scripture. You've got to be in it yourself. I learn more doing what I'm doing right now than when I'm sitting where you are. I've started taking notes at 11 o'clock If you're a preacher, don't be paranoid. The reason I do that is because if I don't, I'm going to forget everything that was said by the time I'm home later that afternoon. It's an old age thing, I think. It's coming on over me. A few other verses about all. 2 Timothy 2, 3, and 4. This is good and is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. What an amazing verse that is. God desires all people to be saved. Matthew 7, 19 to 21. Every tree, all trees that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will be reco- sorry, thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. All God desires all to be saved but not all are saved. Again, that's kind of, how can a sovereign God desire all to be saved and yet not all are saved? It's true. You may be sitting right here right now and not be saved. It could be you. And these people are saying, what? They're not taking the Lord's name in vain. They're saying, Lord, Lord, I worship you. And the Lord doesn't let them in. So how do I get in? <laughs> now that's, that's a tough question that I need time to focus on, but I love these verses from Romans 
chapter 10. And it turns out the word all is kind of included in here, so I felt justified to include it. (laughs) If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God, and it is by confessing with your mouth that you are saved. For all who believe, all who call, sorry, on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's that word all. Everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. So what do I got to do? Confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead. Now there's a little nugget in here. A lot of nuggets in here. But one that impresses me is this says, I believe in my head. No. Even the demons believe that Jesus rose from the dead. They're not going to heaven. You can assent in your head that Jesus was God. I believe Jesus was God. I believe he died on the cross and not be saved. So what does it mean to believe with your heart? Now, fortunately, there's a verse that has the word all in it. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. I was disappointed, though, that this word all is not the same Greek word. It's a different Greek word, but it's translated as all. So that's another assignment. Why is the word different? It means basically the same thing. It's like a synonym. So what does this mean? Well, I was asking myself that question. How do I do this? How do I, I've been thinking about this a lot recently. How do I love God with all my heart, all my mind, all my soul, all my strength? And that's a hard question to answer, but I have brothers and sisters here in the congregation who are demonstrating it to me. That helps. And basically, it's entering into a relationship. I had this graphic I made of heart and mind and soul and strength and how they fit together, and I didn't bring it. (laughs) Because this is something a lot of people have tried, and it's hard. But I think that the heart is the thing that connects our spiritual to our physical, our, our thinking mind to our spiritual mind. And it's our emotions. So if I'm loving God with all my heart, that means I'm all in. I don't say to Beth, my wife, Beth, I love you with all my mind. (laughs) Why why is that funny? Isn't that a good thing to love my wife with all my mind? I hope so. I hope I'm guarding my mind from pornography and things out there that would draw my mind away from her. But I don't say that, do I? Because I love her in a deeper way. I love her with all my heart. And what this verse is, is whatever it means... It means I'm supposed to love God with all of me. All of me. Every day. Every moment. In relationship with God. As I'm driving down the street and I'm thanking God for all the green lights I'm hitting and those who know me know that this is a tangent I take sometimes and I come to a red light, I don't curse and get angry. I say, thank you, Lord, for giving me red light so I can sit here and tell you how much I love you a little more i got to work on the honesty in that, I know, because sometimes I am a little frustrated. But that's, where, that's my goal. Now, last tool thing, right? I did a search on Blue Letter Bible on the phrase, all your heart. What does that mean? What does it mean to love God with all my heart? And this is what I found. Every place where it's used. And it's mostly used in the Old Testament. And it says this, blank God with all your heart. Love God with all your heart. The three times it's used in the New Testament is in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So we're to love God with all our heart. But what does that mean? Search after God with all your heart. To love God with all my heart means I'm searching after him with all my heart. What does that mean? I'm doing the work in the word. Searching after God with all my heart. If you're saved, you will be searching for God with all your heart. Are you? Serve God with all your heart. Are you serving God with all your heart? That's what it says in the Old Testament. I'm supposed to serve God with all my heart. That's a reflection of loving God with all my heart. Are you serving God with all your heart? I've got a lot of work to do, folks. I'm trying. Do you even think about it? Are you saved? Obey God with all your heart. That's a hard one, but I want to do it. 
And the biggest reflection of that, I think, is if I'm loving God with all my heart, I will want to obey Him with all my heart. Turn to God with all your heart. When do I do that? Well, hopefully all the time. When I'm driving down the road, am I turning to God with all my heart? When somebody cuts me off, am I turning to God with all my heart? Am I turning to my flesh with all my stuff? (laughs) Praise God with all your heart. Cling to God with all your heart. Trust God with all your heart. If you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, these are your goals. These are the veins you're trying to mine. This is where you're trying to get. These are the riches you're trying to attain. And by the way, if I've, if I've mined these areas, you've got your own. It's not like I pulled it all out and there's none there. Everybody gets to mine all this gold. That's awesome. We all get to mine this gold. Oh, and return to God with all your heart. <laughs> return to God with all your heart. Yeah, if you even stumble away from him, even in a moment, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm coming back to you. I'm returning to you with all that I am. So my last assignment, study what it means to be in a right relationship with God. I think that's the most important thing. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, there's nothing better. I'll talk to you. You you heard the verses from Romans. It doesn't take magic takes faith. If you're here today and you think you're a Christian, examine your heart. Make sure. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That's what the Word says. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Do you see evidence in your own life, honestly, that the Holy Spirit is present there? Now, I'm not saying this to make anybody paranoid or afraid. But I want to challenge all of you, just if you're not saved and you think you are, it's going to be sad someday in heaven if I look around for you. The Bible says, the Bible implies there's going to be some there that we're surprised there and, and some not that we're surprised aren't. Today we're going to have a baptism. Riley Hood's going to be baptized. And in doing that, she's obeying her Heavenly Father, who she's accepted as her Lord and Savior. And she's taking a step of obedience and showing us all, I'm a Christian. And in doing that, she's also saying to you, and I want you to be one too. And so that's a thrill. So we're going to close our meeting. I'm going to pray. Thankfully, I didn't go too much over. Thanks for your patience. And, uh, and then we're going to sing a song, and the guys are going to get the podium moved to get the area ready up here and then Norris is going to get, come up and get us started on the baptism so let me close in a word of prayer Father God you are good and kind just and loving Lord on and on it goes and yet Lord you are also just and righteous and holy Lord and, and you demand certain things and what you demand most of all is that your Son, Lord Jesus Christ, be honored. (laughs) He deserves it, Lord. Thank you that he came as our Savior. Thank you that for the folks here who know him as their their Savior and Lord. Lord, I just pray that if there's any here today who don't know Jesus as Savior, that they would ask someone who is here who they know does, and that they would get right with you today. And Lord, is anybody here who thinks they're a Christian? but they're really good at checking boxes, but haven't really made a commitment to loving you with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. They might have an honest conversation with you, Father. They probably know in their head the truth. Help it to move to their heart. Lord, I thank you for Riley and her testimony. Bless her for her willingness to stand up here in front of all of us, despite her her fear of crowds and uh, being in front of people and to share a testimony, and to be baptized. What what an encouragement that is. Thank you for your word. It is rich. Help everyone in this room to be motivated to go home and start digging. Digging more. Digging with new tools. Not being afraid to, to take advantage of the resources, the abundant resources that are available to us. Thank you, Lord, that we live in a country where we can get your word in a second's. 
Thank you. Thank you for this time together. Pray these things in your name. Amen.